132. I think you'll enjoy the lesson, Psalm 132. <clears throat> All right, it's a psalm of degrees. It's like as though, it, you know, for several psalms now, we've gone up and gone up and gone up. When it talks about a psalm of degree, it's like we're going upwards, upwards. Like any time the Jews would go to Jerusalem, it was like they were going up to Jerusalem. Whether they was coming from the north, we're going up to Jerusalem. Coming from the south, we're going up to Jerusalem. And they would go on a pilgrim journey. And when they would, they would sing or quote these particular psalms that we've been reading to you. And uh, that's one of the ways in which they would honor the Lord and worship the Lord was through the song of these psalms. These psalms were somehow put into music and sung as a way in which they worshiped. And so, and they would do that. By the way, it would be, don't you think it'd be kind of fun, Marie, to sing on your way to church? Don't you think it'd be kind of fun? Ron does, Ron does. <laughs> but it'd be good, you know, to sing a song on our way to church. Sings a familiar song on our way to church. And that's what these are, these psalms are, are that. They're on their way to the temple, on their way to Jerusalem to worship. And as they go, this is uh, one of the psalms that they would sing. Let me read Psalm 132 uh, <clears throat> to us. Psalm 132, Lord, remember David and all his afflictions, how he swore unto the Lord and vowed unto the mighty God of Jacob. Now I want to say just a quick word about that second verse. It says he vowed unto the mighty God of Jacob. He made a promise to God. He made a promise to God. That's what that's saying. He made a promise to God. And I want to admonish you, don't make a promise to God if you don't plan on keeping it. Um, and secondly, don't start something and not finish it. You know, I want to do something for the Lord. I think most Christians want to do something for the Lord, don't you? Don't, I mean, I remember when I first got saved, I wanted to do something for the Lord. Uh, it just hit me that way. But uh, he's saying, don't make a promise to God if you really are not going to try to keep it. Verse 3. Surely I will not come into the tabernacle of my house, nor go into my bed. I will not give sleep in mine eyes or slumber to mine eyelids until I find out a place for the Lord, until I have a place to worship God, until I can build a temple for the Lord. And David wanted to build a temple. Uh, for the Lord. And he said, and, and, until I find out a place for the Lord and habitation for the mighty God of Jacob. Lo, we heard of it at Ephrata. We found it in the fields of the wood, talking about the tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant, I mean, the Ark of the Covenant. And that's where they, they located it. And he said, we will go into his tabernacles. We will worship at his footstool. Arise, O Lord, into thy rest, thou and the ark of thy strength. Let thy priests be clothed with righteousness, and let thy saints shout for joy. For thy, uh, for thy servant David's sake, turn not away the face of thine anointed. And I thought to myself, I remembered the verse that I read. I remembered the verse where David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I remembered that verse as I read that verse there. It came to my mind. The Lord has sworn in truth unto David, he will not turn from it. Of the fruit of thy body will I <clears throat> set upon thy throne. In other words, David, your sons, your descendants are going to sit on the throne, on your throne. When it's time, I'm going to put one of your children on the throne. And he did, as you know, Solomon was next in line. Verse 12, if thy children will keep my covenant and my testimony that I shall teach them, their children shall also sit upon thy throne forevermore. For the Lord hath chosen Zion, that's Jerusalem. <clears throat> he hath desired it for his habitation. This is my rest forever. Here will I dwell, for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless her provision I will satisfy her poor with bread. I will also clothe her priests with salvation and her saints 
shall shout aloud for joy. Boy, it'd be fun to come to church, just everybody shouting, wouldn't it? Man, alive, happy, 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 shouting in the Lord, hallelujah. Verse 17, there will I make the horn of David. When it speaks of the horn, he's speaking of his strength. David will be strong. He'll be a strong leader. I wish we had a strong leader right now. <laughs> There will I make the horn of David to bud. I have ordained a lamp for mine anointed. His enemies will I clothe with shame, but upon himself shall his crown flourish. This particular psalm, Psalm 132, is a prayer of David, and he is remembering some of the things that God has done for him. It's always kind of neat to look back and see how God has worked in your life and brought you along the way. And it's okay sometimes to look backwards to see what God has done. But like I've taught you and like Solomon teaches us in his uh, Ecclesiastes, it's not good to stay back there. It's okay to look back there. It's okay to learn from your past. But we have a future and we also want to look to the future and we want to keep our eyes focused on the things ahead of us. And I remember telling you last Sunday morning, <clears throat> we don't want to make the past sound so lip-smacking good that our children give up hope that they themselves will have some of those good old days like we talk about. Because their good old days are right now. And so we've got to make sure that they have something to look forward to. And by the way, as parents and grandparents, we want to do everything we can to make their lives just a little bit better. Um, <clears throat> David's heart is filled with the joy of the Lord. <clears throat> and I noticed that when the people saw the joy of the Lord in David's life, when the people saw the joy of the Lord in David's life, they begin to shout with joy. They begin to be excited about the things of God. You reckon that would work in the home? You reckon that would work in our homes? You know, get excited about, man, I'm going to church. Man, it's wonderful. Man, we're on our way. I think it might help for us, our, uh, we ourselves, to get excited about the fact we're getting ready to go to the Lord's house and worship. <clears throat> I think it might help our children. Um, <clears throat> Lord, he says, do you remember when my life was in great turmoil? Mm. You remember when my life was in great turmoil? Anybody ever have any turmoil in their life? Oh, my. David said, Lord, do you remember when I was in great turmoil? <laughs> he says, I couldn't rest. And You know, sometimes, you know, our problems get so big, we can't rest. You know what? We can't rest. David couldn't rest. But his, his, he was talking about the fact that he wanted to build a house for the Lord, a temple for the Lord. He said, I couldn't sleep. All I could think about was how... I could serve my God. Man, that is a powerful thought. His mind was on the things of God and he thought about the things of the Lord. He couldn't hardly go to sleep for thinking about what he was going to do for his God. <laughs> David, this is a very important point for all of us right here. David, like so many of us, wanted to do something great for his God. David wanted to do something great for his God. You know, I think just about every Christian goes through that moment of wanting to do something great for God. David ruled from Jerusalem. He wanted to build the temple, a resting place for the Ark of the Covenant. Through the years, through the years, I personally have had many people say similar words to me. Brother Paul, I want to do something great for God. Brother Paul, I want to do something big for God. And I think they mean it. But let me tell you something. You better count the cost before you start. Because when you make a commitment to God, Satan is coming after you. When you got saved immediately Satan began to work on you. When you made a commitment to serve God, 
Satan goes to work too. He wants to, he wants to cause you to give up. He wants you to, to quit. Uh, and so when you make a commitment to God, you need to be ready. And we need to learn the importance of putting on the whole armor of God. Through the years, I've had probably a number of people say those very words. I want to do something great for God. Um, let's see. He wasn't, but David, excuse me, but David was not allowed to do what he wanted to do. For he had too much blood shed in his life. Some of y'all might know that story. But he wanted to build the temple. But he wasn't allowed to build the temple because there was too much bloodshed. But at least he did this. He gathered all the materials and he put the money aside to build the temple. It would be his son Solomon that God would use to build the temple. The temple would be built and there they would place the Ark of the Covenant. And there the people would go to worship God. The priests would offer their sacrifices. They would read the law and teach the people. For God's people needed a place where they could go and meet together and worship. Do you think that's still true today? Do you think God's people still need a place to go? to meet together, to worship God. We can worship God anywhere. But I think he's given us the church so we can come together as a people and worship the Lord. And not only worship, but learn. Learn the word of God. A wise man never ceases to learn. Only the fool already knows it all. Now, you and I in the New Testament... We're kind of under a different covenant. We know that God does not dwell in a tabernacle made with hands. We know that, don't we? What we now know is that God dwells in you. You who believe. God lives in you. Those of you who have put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, God lives in you. Our body, according to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, our body is called the temple of God. What, know you not that your body is the temple of God? We do not have to go to a city. We don't have to get in a car and drive to a city. We don't have to go to a building to be able to worship our Savior. We can worship our God anytime and any place because God lives in us. You, like King David, you are a chosen vessel. You are a chosen vessel. Out of the billions of people in this world, out of the billions of people, God chose you. He lives in you. He has chosen to live in you. And you are right now of great value to God and your fellow man. You are of great value to God. And your fellow man. It is important for us to take care of the temple of God. It's important for us to take care of the temple of God. Do you think God wants to bless you? God wants to. You think God wants to bless you? Think He does? Do you think God wants to take care of you? He always does. Will he provide for our needs? Will he provide for our needs? Well, he is our father. Why wouldn't he? He's, a, he's, he's more of a father than our earthly father ever could be. He is, he is the father that will never leave you or forsake you. He's the father that will meet every need. He will bless you. Well, I said he will bless you so that you might be able to bless others. 
We don't want to just get blessed. And bless. This reminds me of that prayer. I heard this guy pray one time. He prayed. He kept putting the blessings in his pocket till his pockets were full. And he prayed for blessings, but God didn't bless him anymore because his pockets were already full. It wasn't until he reached in his pocket and emptied the pockets that he prayed and the Lord would refill his pockets and just keep blessing. And he became in, the, in his prayer a channel through which God blessed others around him. I said, be careful not to be filled with pride when God begins to bless your life. Be sure to bless others as God blesses you. Be sure to bless others as God blesses you. And I read this in the Psalms. God will take from the heathen <laughs> and give to the righteous. And as he does so, make sure you help the poor and the down and outers and the orphans. Sometimes doing something great for God will involve simply helping the people closest to you. Doing something great for God. I want to do something great for God. I want to be a missionary and save China. I want to be a missionary and go and do this. Or I want to be a preacher and preach to thousands. But sometimes doing something great for God will involve helping those people who are right around you. You do not have to cross a border to be a missionary. There are no laws against being kind and generous. There are no laws against being kind and generous. You know, I've learned through the years that when you're kind and generous, it, it opens doors for you to be able to talk to people. You know, it opens doors when you're kind and generous. Uh, they're more uh, uh, acceptable to what you've got to say. You determine in your own heart to make the world a better place wherever you are. Let the light of Jesus shine in you and through you. I've heard this many times. Smile. Just simply smile. Life is good when you have Jesus living in you. Life is good when you have Jesus living in you. You will have a greater impact than you might think over the many years that we have been involved in serving Christ, and they are many. We have been privileged to see hundreds of children and teenagers getting saved and baptized. Oh, what a blessing it is. What a blessing it has been. Oh, my goodness. So sweet to see kids and, and teenagers saved. And it's a blessing to see adults saved, too, by the way. It's a blessing to see that occur. Over those, over those years, I personally have known four young men who are now preaching and pastoring churches who came through our ministry. Well, four, that's not a lot, but that's a few, who are now preaching and pastoring through this church, through this church, 30 missionaries and mission projects are regularly supported. Now, I know people drive by every day. They come down Baker Boulevard and they look over here. They look north and they say, oh, look at that little church. I bet you I've had 100 people say that to me. Oh, look at that little church. Well, we might be kind of small in number. That is true. But I've learned little is much when God is in it. <laughs> and with God, all things are possible. And the prayer of a righteous man avails much, not little, And I have to put a little star in our crown. 
when every other church in town was closed, Messiah Baptist Church remained open. Amen. Hallelujah. And I'll tell you, it wasn't easy. Little is much. I make a good song, Ron. Little is much when God is in it. Labor not for wealth or fame. I'm very thankful that through it all, God has remained faithful to his church and to his people. God has remained faithful. And I'll give you a fair warning. The arm of flesh may fail you, but God will remain strong and faithful. And he'll not take you to it, he'll take you through it. Amen. All right, I hope you enjoyed that lesson.